tuning into another episode of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Uh, with me today, I have someone who has a collection that I am incredibly envious of uh, and uh, has been keeping super busy these last few months now that the world's opening up again. Uh, we have Shane from Evergreen State Reptiles. How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. Doing well. Appreciate being invited. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. I, oh, is any excuse to be able to just talk to snakes to people outside of, you know, like the local reptile store? Uh, I'm always going to be super appreciative of. So, um, I mean, do we want to go through the whole rigmarole of how you got started into this or? Handle it. Let's go. I mean, right. we got we to gotta use the time. So sounds good. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So um, when did you first decide that, hey, I like the creepy, uh, the, the legless lizards and all the stuff that everyone likes to call these amazing animals? Well, I mean, I, when I was just a little kid, man, like, you know, four or five years old, I was all reptile all the time. Like, I didn't want to do anything but go dig through the wood pile and, and catch lizards and stuff and, and salamanders and newts and all that stuff. We only have uh, one species of lizard here, but lots of salamanders, lots of frogs, lots of garter snakes. But yeah, I mean, I've always just been uh, into it full time since the beginning. You know, I think you're kind of born into it, like, you either have a fascination with it or you don't. That's true. You know? Very few people will you ever meet that's a scale head after, after their life. You know what I mean? Like they either started that way. I would say probably 95 out of hundred people just have it inside them. And then, you know, you'll meet those five people that were kind of blessed to learn later. You know what I mean? And they kind of became, so. Yeah. That's true. And uh, that's kind of what I'm hoping for too, is to get those, uh, to grow that 5% a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, get those non-believers in here. Um, well, it seems like YouTube's pretty good for reaching out and and uh, or just really all social media for kind of bringing new people into the fold. But yeah, it's definitely true. Uh, so um, you kind of are a bit of a jack of tr- jack of all trades when it comes to your collection and what you're doing with, right? Kind of, yeah, kind of. I mean, I would say. Uh, I don't have this thing about wanting to produce as many species as I can before it's over with. Yeah, I get that. Cause I, I kind of feel like, you know, there's, there's people that produce ball pythons and they're producing, you know, the twenty five thirty thousand dollars ball pythons. And, and, uh, that's one species though. And that's all they do. You know, I want, like, I feel like if I'm going to, not that I expect to be remembered or anything, but if uh, I can hang my hat at the end of the day on anything, I want it to be like that guy could produce anything. Like, you know what I mean? I feel like I'm, I'm really cruising down that path. Yep. And, and the way I go about things um, has worked out for me as far as producing multiple species and out of the same room, mind you. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of people probably aren't able to, to do it that way. I think I, where I live in the Pacific Northwest has kind of helped me with that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, each rack has, you know, thermostats with night drop and in the winter it's cold as hell in here. And I don't even move the ball pythons out. I've never had an RI. Hmm. They're individually heated properly. Right. But I'm saying the room itself, it gets cold as shit. Excuse my language. Cold as <laughs> it's got, I don't know what your rules are on YouTube, but, um, or your <laughs> deal, but they, it gets cold. So nevertheless, but I mean, I actually was making a list the other day. My friend asked me, hey, make a list of all the species you've bred. And I know I'm still missing a bunch, but I've only been doing this since 2017. Oh, wow. I was breeding rosy boas back in 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. And I was breeding quite a few of them, pure locality rosies. I really enjoyed it. I love a rosy boa. They're beautiful creatures and there's so many different colors and patterns, you know, like coastal to mainland to mexican to you know they're just amazing and i love rubber boas because i'm from Pacific northwest we have rubber boas and it's almost like a rubber boa it's one of the two boa species in north america but uh i kind of i didn't abandon it i just kind of progressed life and bought a house and had the kids and started working 95 nine to five you know and uh i ended up losing my job and Kind of in like 2015, I was like, man, where do I go next? Right. And uh, social media kind of got bigger, right? And you see all this stuff on social media, like, you know, don't work nine to five for somebody else and, and not work for yourself. 
right 10 hours a week or two hours when you get home or whatever so i kind of started thinking man i love reptiles and even when i sold my rosy boa collection i still had a black pine snake and i think i had a green tree python and i mean uh there's i had some cool lizard species a couple monitors and i mean i was still in the hobby as far as a keeper goes but um 2016 2015 2016 i went down to socal and did a show with a friend right kind of saw how the shows are run down there the shows here hadn't like they're they're progressed now to where they're like pretty pretty uh pretty amazing you know i mean for for the area because you got to remember the demographic like it's a whole culture down in socal and florida but it's not quite like that up here in the Pacific northwest and and our shows are pretty amazing considering the fact you know but uh, I watched my friend do it, helped him do a show. And, I, you know, I was like, man, it's it's like excitement, right? It's almost like getting ready for the football game for me. I play college football, so it's almost like being in the locker room before the game, lacing up your, your cleats. You know, I just it was like I kind of got a little adrenaline rush from it, kind of got pumped up. So I just kind of went all in, but I, I took my time getting there. You know, I, I started with cheap racks and a few projects and – progressed and and the few projects in the very first year i held back man like probably like especially the cow kings because i love cow kings i held back almost everything i produced yeah and uh, this is kind of my coming out year for that like all those babies are producing animals this year so yeah i I can tell your social media it's just eggs 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 right now Yeah. yeah and 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 uh yeah, I just kind of figured, you know, like, and then I lost my job last May with COVID mm-hmm. and uh, I needed to, like, I, I, you got to bet on yourself. And uh, I did it in a sort of way, but I was kind of forced to. So May COVID happened, lost a job. And um, I was ready though. Like I probably should have been looking to make an exit, you know, and do this. Cause I, I built this up for this year, right? Last year it actually wasn't the best breeding season for me. I had 19 clutches and I was probably expecting 35. Yeah, we always get those years too. And well, the hog nose is, I was working with a lot of, I breed a lot of hog nose and, and I was, anybody listen that wants to get involved and or is a breeder or a collector, you never want to buy adult snakes for your breeding projects. And that's where I went wrong. So I bought adult snakes. You don't know how old they are. You don't know how well they breed. Why is somebody selling an adult female hog nose? You know, you need to question that. And I didn't. I was just like, oh, a great deal on adult female. So, you know, they're burned out or they didn't produce. And, you know, I got a few clutches and and luckily I held almost everything back last year. I I mean, I kept almost, I raised up 79 hognose, tricolors and westerns from last year that are staying here, you know, and, uh, and I bought all babies yearling or down, you know, if you buy a yearling, go for it. But Anytime, like, it seems like with an adult animal, especially hog nose, they're so much more finicky than people know or they want to believe. They're one of the more difficult snakes. You buy a female or, excuse me, an adult and ship at time zones, it, it does something to them, man. It's, it can either revitalize them or it can break them down. You mm-hmm. know, like, they're that barometric pressure, what they're used to. They're very finicky snakes, you know. So, anyway, this is my coming out year. Everything I'm breeding is either raised from a baby or yearling produced by me and i hit clutch 50 today which is great for your podcast i'm glad to be doing it so i can say i actually hit that number 50 you know that was a that's a big deal for me i mean i I don't know how a lot of people i don't i i don't i don't really know what other people do but i mean the goal was 40 and we hit 50 and and it's just the middle of may you know end of may i i think i got 40 something ball pythons and probably 10 of them are breeding age mm-hmm. and I've only got three clutches. So I, I could pull another four to six, seven, eight clutches out of them. Got another bull snake ready to go. Still waiting on my Crebos. And I got some double clutches going on with some King snakes and a couple that haven't laid yet. So, you know, I could hit 60. I mean, who knows? I, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's insane. It's amazing. Like that's definitely sustainable for, for my family though. So. Well, that's good. I'm really glad. Yeah, it's, I've, I've, I was, I need to, I'm going to hammer into the hog nose a little bit just because, uh, like I Go mentioned for before, um, that, you know, here in Colorado, we can't keep any rear fang venomous. Um, we used to be able to have hog nose and hog nose. Everybody wants hog nose here, but, you know, meh. 
Um, yeah. But that's, I mean, that's crazy. Like I've been, I've been watching your social media a little bit and it's, you've just been kind of, it seems like you are just constantly busy, just going, going nuts on all the eggs and the bedding and everything else. Like, and you've been doing, you've been vending shows like crazy too, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I did Phoenix for a friend, helped him out at his booth. He wasn't able to make it. So two of his employees came with everything. And I, from Temecula, the reptile shop, and I flew in and I worked that show with him, not on my animals, but just helping a friend out right after we had our first Oregon show in a long time. Like, you know, since right. Or local show rather we had, uh, in 2020 in January, we had the Portland show, which is a one day and it's a great show. And then the very next weekend we had the Puyallup show, which is in Seattle. And that was a great show. And then we didn't do anything until Salt Lake in October, which was a great show. So October was the last show we had. Hmm. Excuse me. I had, uh, we did the show in Oregon and then we did the show in Salt Lake right after. And then I actually flew down to Vegas to visit my uncle and I attended that show just to kind of check it out and, and, and kind of check out the lay of the land to see if I want to do it, mm-hmm. you know, in the future. And I had some snakes there too at, at, at the reptile shops booth. I had some tricolors and, uh, sold well there too. So yeah, I feel like tricolors you know. do extremely well. They're hit and miss, man. I mean, I've taken, you know, 10 to a show expect, expecting to, to sell out of them and I'll sell zero or one and then I'll take 10 to a show and within four hours, all 10 are gone. And it's what's interesting about the tricolors. Everybody wants to do the, uh, uh, bioactives. Mm-hmm. You, you couldn't find a better snake than a tricolor hognose for a bioactive. I mix the cocoa dirt. What do they call that? Cocoa core. Mm-hmm. With cypress and or cocoa, the cocoa, uh, the husk, the block, yeah. the block, yeah, and that's what they use, right? And I keep it nice and damp, and uh, but I'm telling you, they they sit it between 79 and 82. You don't need a hot spot, so if you want to put live plants in there and your isopods and stuff, and your uh, what is it, a uh, zoo med front open door deal? Oh yeah, you. I mean, and they're on frozen thawed. You just toss a mouse in there and, and don't even watch. It's gone the next day. Wow. It's like, oh yeah, it's it's amazing. And I always tell people you can throw up the T five, and that'll keep the cage at eighty. Especially if you use a low boy, you right? Know, if you have a couple of live little succulents or whatever, and set your stuff up cool. That's but right. tricolors, I mean, they're the people that know what they are. They want them, yeah. and I think it's it's just a matter of time before it really hits hard. You know, because you heard- got the hog nose look, yeah, and you got the milk snake skin. That's- and I don't mean by color; I mean like it feels like a milk snake. You know. Oh, so they're um because I've actually never handled them before. They don't have the. uh They're not keeled like a there western. We go, yeah. You know. Yeah, they're yeah. just super smooth. Really nice animals. Are they easy to get going. Dude, I I mean, for years my uncle produced them back in the nineties and. I'm thinking I'm I'm I, my guess would be back in the nineties he was probably producing them from wild caught adults and he was probably lucky to get what he got and he never got the babies going and huh. then finally he was like I'm not even gonna try to breed these anymore. But I don't have a problem. I, I use fish one time hmm. and froze and uh, with a dead mouse one time and, and none of them will eat. Not you won't it's not like a western where you get like a third of them will eat pinkies without scent or half. I just do fish every time once and then right into frozen thawed and i mean i've last year i produced 78 or 79 i can't one of the in the 70s <laughs> there was two of them that took two scented meals before they went on i mean that's cool. that wasn't that's insane yeah i know because i've heard nothing but you know like basically horror stories getting baby westerns to get going oh it's so easy it's oh, it's really? not as hard as people there's a trick to it like you know, like ball pythons, they hatch. You keep them in the incubator. You give them, I, I keep them in the incubator. I clean them up. I put them back in the tub, and I put a dish of water in there. And they stay in there all together until they shed. Then I remove them. So with hognose, and you feed them, right? Same yeah. thing with the king snake. You wait for king snake to shed, then you feed it. With hognose, the day they leave that egg, if you put a mouse in front of them, 75% of them are going to eat it. And if they do, they're done. And then the other ones, yeah, you do. I mean, I do tuna water and I don't have a problem. And I do the whole thing dipped. And the next time I do the half, then the next time I just touch the face, 
time after that, they usually eat it. It's not, it's not that hard. No, that's awesome. That's really good. That's, it's, you know, it's people that want to keep babies in glass tanks. Hognos are so finicky. They need that ambient temperature of like a baby tub. And a too big of a tub is going to throw them off. So like the pencil tubs that people look at and they say, that's not fair for that snake to live in there. I mean, those are money. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? A baby hog nose needs to be in a, a confined space and they just, they rock. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I only ever had one um, Western before they kind of really cracked down on the rules um, here. And he was never had any issues going with them. He was a yearling and I kept him in what I honestly thought would have been too small of a thing, but I like to fake bluff strike me a lot, but he was really good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 easy, man. It's re- it really is easy. Uh, I mean, I should have. I don't have as many as I thought I was going to have this year, for whatever reason. My females laid, you know, like I had this one female one year, and she was old. She double clutched twenty four and twenty two eggs. Okay, and I think that's hereditary. By the way, if you got a snake that double clutches, you should be holding females back. Okay, I was going to ask. Yeah, you. I think that passes on. Cool. Interesting. So I mean. Um, my hog nose now, I think my biggest clutch this year was 13 eggs and most of them were like between five and eight, but you know, I brought, so the bigger, the female, I think the, the least likely they are to breed too. Hmm. It seems like the smaller females within the 200 to 225 gram do the best breeding. That's, that's what I've came to determine. Interesting. So do you think if you like kind of kept them lean and mean, like just kind of really slow groom, you'd probably get a few more years of good, healthy clutches out of them. I don't know. I, I, like I say, I haven't had any trouble breeding smaller females, but I've had trouble breeding larger females and it has nothing to do with um, the anatomy of the male or whatever being like too big. Cause males, you can breed them at 35, 40 grams. Those are your bre- best breeding males. Hmm. When they get, you know, I bred a male at eight months old and he 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 did amazing when you get males that are big and sluggish they're not the best breeders but some some are and then some other males even small ones they don't want to breed you know they're just they don't have that instinct to go get it so the female is the same thing though when you get a big heavy female i mean i've seen hog nose you know we're talking big as big around you know like we're talking you know coke bottle size or uh, coke can size or close and I've never had success with those. Hmm. You know, the, I had one big girl that was over 400 grams and it didn't matter what male I put her to. She slugged out and, uh, hog nose are tough to breed anyway, though. I mean, you have to get them cold enough and it's, it, it's hard to get that through to people. Kind of like some people. I, yeah. Rosy bows too. Okay. You got to keep those things dry and cold. But, uh, some people say that you can drop them to 75 and still do well. Hmm. And I've seen people do that or not even cool them, just kind of like let the barometric pressure change the atmosphere. And, and I've seen a few people successful with that, but I think it has a lot to do with where they live. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but for me, if I don't get mine cold enough, we're talking low fifties, but the best is probably about 48. Oh, wow. I don't have as, as much success. So. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's always so weird to me when you start going into more than just like, balls and corns like how different like the changes of you know the time of year the temperature how long you brew made like all of those start to get a little not necessarily nitpicky but it matters a little bit more than just you know all right let them go off for two months then just pound them with food yeah so i mean corns don't really need to go off right i mean my friend of mine he uh, produces his without cooling them i produce i cool mine my clubers get cold uh cooled Mm -hmm. There's certain species from South America that get a little different cooling period. And, uh, but I mean, the corn should breed regardless. Yeah, they kind of do. The barometric pressure, they can feel the change of the season. They don't necessarily need that deep cool. And I mean, I would say, but most colubrids, except for Hondurans, Hondurans are kind of, I, you know, my uncle, he cools his, but, uh, a friend of mine, he hangs a curtain, a black, a black curtain in front of the rack. That's keeps it. Keeps them on the same heat, and then he rolls the curtain up four hours a day huh. for light, because you know his reptile room the lights on for twelve hours, right? Or or maybe even sixteen. You wake up in the morning, you turn the light on, you go to bed, you turn it off. But um, he gives them light for four to six hours, and he's super, super 
um, good at it, right? I mean, he, he gets full full production, and we're talking those snakes are never below seventy six degrees. So who knows? Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Do your tricolors? Uh, they have to go through different than a lot of the westerns. Negative. They're just like my balls. I keep I keep the tricolors and the balls the same. They get heat year round in their tub. The outside of their tub, like I said, this room gets to 50. And some ball breeders are probably just freak out about that. But like I said, I've never had an RI, never had an issue. I'm getting great um, breeding. A friend of mine that's a killer ball breeder, he cools his whole room the same way I do. And he's only a ball breeder. And he opens the window in Washington up north, drops the room into the low 60s, but keeps the heat on the balls. Right. Every one of his female produces. So they feel that cold air front. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, but the tub itself, if you were up against the tub, you would feel that kind yeah. of warm to cool exchange. But the tub itself is uh, is still heated. So, you know, I don't do a night drop on the balls. I do a night drop on almost everything else. Yeah, that's, so. yeah. I Actually, I don't, I don't really do much of a night drop on my balls either. The bow is due. The colubrid's are ambient, so, but... Yeah, you're because your room's eighty two, probably right, or eighty one. Yep, eighty one to eighty four, just depending on the time of the year, and then I just kind of let it drop down a little bit in the winter. So yeah, yeah, there you go. And, and your colubrids do well, or um, you have good production. I'm still most of my i I got really big into. I was a big boa boa guy at first, and then a big setback with that, and I went, "We'll do ball pythons." And then you know, it's fun to play Doctor Frankenstein a little bit with all the morphs and stuff, but it is the same species of snake. The husbandry doesn't change. And as long as you have that dialed in, it's just kind of like open set, forget. Yeah. And, you know, as I learn more and get into people and, you know, go to shows and talk to more people like you. And it's like, Oh, there's so many other types of snakes out there. And so I have a hard time um, balancing between, I like to play Frankenstein with all these really cool, crazy ball Python morphs and then just getting into stuff. So I'm, kind of nitpicking around with different uh colubrid species like i have some pines that are coming up and be ready to go next year um some northern i i bred pines that was my first breed oh really louisiana pure oh, pure wow. Utah, yeah yeah i got out of them just because i couldn't sell them yeah we wanted them and then of course they got the the uh they went into the federal protection to where you can't cross state lines without a permit and then everybody wanted them but yep. i take them to shows and nobody knew what they were so yeah, everyone just thinks it's like what it's okay it's a bull snake what but yeah i do like them though man i miss them and i'd like to have black pines again but they're again they're they're protected now so if i'm gonna buy a protected snake i would buy uh indigos and pay for the the deal and but i, I mean i have black tail crevos and dude that's the only thing this year that hasn't produced and i produced last year and the year before hmm. but you know i don't know I'm, I like, you know, I almost feel like I'm not good at breeding until I, I can figure those things out and get them down to a T. It kind of drives me nuts. Everybody kind of has that like Everest species, huh? Well, that's like, I mean, that's what I like the best in the room. Like those are my favorite snakes and the false waters are tearing it up. The po- the bulls are tearing it up. And last year, the female, so everybody says if they don't lay by April, they're not going to lay. And my female laid in the middle of July, completely <laughs> fertile clutch, but she laid it under the lay box. Oh. And I thought, okay, she's not going to go. And I kept looking at her and she had like a color change. She got real blonde, hmm. real beautiful, real pastel blonde. And I thought, why does the snake look different now? Like, that's so weird. She's huh. kind of a darker snake. And I thought, kind of picking her up and feeling her. And she's, I'm like, maybe it has eggs, maybe it doesn't. So I kept checking. Mm-hmm. every day and you couldn't see the difference and after she laid oh, and dude. she laid 19 fertile eggs oh. and they were smaller than i'd seen in the past but they were all fertile they all had little diamond cuts on them mm-hmm. under the damn egg box so they were all dry in aspen oh, that sucks the, yeah the year before she only laid the male was young and she was young she laid five fertile out of 10 and uh I incubated them at 82, which is too warm. Yeah. They got to be incubated about 76, 77. I got two to hatch. I was happy. I mean, it was like a start. I was like, okay, I'll get this down. And then, of course, last year, she laid them under the dang lay box. 
which is rare. And then this year I haven't got a lay, but both of them have just shed and they almost look like they were ovulating b- before last shed, this last shed. So, you know, maybe that was a post ovulation shed and maybe we'll get eggs in the next 10 to 15 days. Who knows? That's cool. Yeah. Sometimes I like to mess. I need that, man. I need that. I need the black tail crevos. It's my favorite snake. Oh man. So, are those but, the- uh, what's that? Are those the only uh, dry mark on you keep? Yeah, I have the false waters which aren't dry mark on, but and I have the Musarana female. I don't have a male for her. And she's not dry mark on either, but I mean they're they're the same. They're like Big they're so giant. closely related, you know yeah. what I mean? Especially the Musarana. Like, I mean I take care of them all the same. So someday I'll get the Musarana male, but right now she's the only pet snake I own. I mean I mean they're all pets, right? Take care of them all. But I mean she's the only snake in here that's not on a mission. Right. Everything else is on a mission. Is your, uh, I so, think I've seen a couple of pictures. Your Mosterana, is it fairly high white? No, it's a, it's, it's actually, I would say it's probably like 70% black, 30% white. I, I actually like the pied mm-hmm. 50, 50 or close to, I, I'm not into the super pied Mosterana. Okay. I don't like them so much. I had two of them. And what's interesting about those is the whole body's white and the head's black. There's no variant. There's no variant. It's when you breed breed to uh, like a super pied to a pied or two supers to two supers. It's going to be the same thing every time. Black head, white body, and you might get a small black tail tip. So That's, I don't know. I kind of like the like the little bit. I like the different contrast for sure too. Yeah, me too. Like I mean, the only reason I got into ball pythons was for the VPI exam taking the highway. Yeah, I, get I wanted to touch base with that earlier. So it's a good opportunity, but. Um, so originally I was all colubrids, right? And I, and I had quite a bit of success. And I think at least if someone sees this, they could argue that, but maybe they don't <laughs> want to admit it. But I, I, when I did the local shows, I was kind of the only colubrid guy. And mm-hmm. you got, you know, 25 ball b- breeders and you got 15 crested breeders and you have the odds and ends people in there as well. So I think people saw the success with the colubrids because, I, I mean, I knew of 10 vendors that, after seeing me do it for a couple of years, they're like kings, milks, corn, or uh, corns and hogs. They went right into it. Right. So originally, I was like, okay, you know, the, I got to think. I got to think about myself. And uh, they they breed all ball pythons, so I'm thinking I need to have some ball pythons then too. And I do like balls, but colubrids are my favorite. But I wanted to be able to, you know, if they're going to kind of look at my customer base, I want to kind of look at theirs. And I was already liking balls and I just didn't buy any. I'm sure you've seen my ball memes. I crack on it all the time. It's kind yeah, of more for fun. Do, but yeah. Exactly. It's more for fun. But um, nothing really had caught my eye, you know, like the, as far as genetic wise. And then I started really looking at it in the highway, the freeway, and the VPI Exanthic. And I'm like, that's where I want. That's the direction I'm going in. So I've got some head clown vpi exanthic stuff going i've got some visual pied vpi exanthic i've got some g stripe pastel g stripe vpi exanthic going and then i have four highway girls and a killer highway male nice. and the girls have other genetics butter highway and you know so on and so forth pastel highway and uh I mean, the highway did that. The highway thing really wrapped me back into balls. I had balls when I was like 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I love them, right? They're, they're, it's just a different, they're all snakes, but they're also different. You know what I mean? You get a big Honduran milk snake, it's cruising and you're holding in. It's a little leaner, but it's still kind of heavy, yep. a little longer. And, you know, and then you got your ball python. It's more of a chill snake. People come and hang out at the house and get the ball pythons out and everybody hang out. And, whatever you know but that's why i got back into balls plus i wanted year-round breeding i wanted to find something because with balls you're always working with them you're always expecting a clutch yeah pretty so much if i'm going to be doing this full time i wanted to do it full time when my colubrids go to sleep when i choose to put them down for three or four months there's really not much to do other than check waters every 10 days maybe sooner maybe even wait a while um and then you know i went into blue tongue skinks as well that's the only lizard species i'm working with and i've worked with several in the past and i've produced several but blue tongues just fit well in the room the northern as far as how to keep them so 
that I mean, you keep them the same as ball pythons for the most part with, yeah. with a very minimal winter. You know, they have a minimal winter. So that's really cool. That's that's definitely I was I was going to get to there at some point. I was going to say because you're you're now doing this full time like that's this is this is it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't plan. And that's the other thing we're talking about betting on yourself. So when I lost my job in May, there was an opportunity to have two years of schooling paid for. Mm-hmm. And like everybody that left did that. And I already have a degree, but you, my, I mean, I could have got two years of schooling paid for and you get like a little bit of cash too. Like, I mean, it was a good deal. And I was like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to for- forego that. And I'm just going to go right into my own thing. I'm 36 years old now. I got to at some point believe in myself and, and go that route. So that's what I did. That's and I think it's going to be all right. You know, I'd like to get out of this space and into a small facility or a you know, move, move from here and get a, a house with maybe like a half acre or an acre. Mm-hmm. And so I could have a rodent barn. I can't have a rodent barn where I'm at. I spend probably 15 to $18,000 a year on rodents. And, uh, yeah. if you're doing it yourself, you're spending two grand. You know what I mean? That food and bedding does get to you. Cause then you kind of get the same mentality with your feeders. Or this is like, I tried to do small scale rodent breeding, but it ends up taking just so much time. Like it takes more time dedicated to that than the reptiles. And, but there's a lot of oh, yeah. local like rats. Depends on how you break up your time. But I mean, for yeah. me, I'm allergic to rodents. Ooh, yeah. So I'd have to wear like, you know, I can't have them in this reptile room because I don't want to wear a damn mask. You know, uh, what do you call those with the canisters? Oh, like, yeah. I'd have to go that I'd have to go that route. I'd have to, you know, have like a tough shed where I could open the door and have some ventilation and wear one of those deals because my I just get a scratchy throat and start coughing like crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been told that uh, like to keep that down because, you know, eventually a lot of people just develop them, too. Um, I've heard that too. People that don't have problems for a couple of years, the next thing you know, they're coughing and hacking. Yep. It's just like, you got to keep them really clean. So like, you know, once a week changing them, then them out entirely is not enough. And so you get into doing it like every third or fourth day too. And then that Aspen starts to, not that Aspen, like the softwood bedding or whatever starts to go up too. But eh. Well, I tell you what, we had guinea pigs when I was a kid and I wasn't allergic to them. Hmm. We had them for four years. And then one day, I mean, my face turned red and I was sneezing and sneezing. My mom took me to the doctor and they did a test and they said, oh, well, you know, you're allergic to rodent saliva. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, a lot of people tend to think it has to do with the urine and like the dander. When they breathe, you know, they put molecules in the air. It's the actual saliva Mm -hmm. that I had an allergy to. So it wouldn't really matter how clean you kept rodents. I mean, they're in their breathing. I'm going to be start sneezing. So, oh man, that's eesh. oh yeah. But dude, big time bummer. Yeah, I was going to say like, do you ever? Because I know like once people kind of get to that point where you're at, where you you know you're having you know fifty, sixty clutches a year minimum, um, for like a good a good year, not like a crazy year, but a good year. When you start branching yeah. out looking for places, is that kind of something that ever kind of nags you in the back of my head? That always makes me worry too. Because then, like, if you have a separate facility, even if it's 15 minutes away, that's still 15 minutes away of, like, a crisis a little bit. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I mean, I try not to think about that kind of stuff. I don't I don't yeah. really worry about that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, you, you take care of your animals, you check your, check your equipment, and you make sure they got fresh water, and they're not sitting in their own, sitting in their own shit, and... You know, they should be just fine. You shouldn't. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't worry too much about a facility. People, I mean, you got all the cameras and stuff nowadays, and you know what I mean. True. And I mean, that's you're doing it full time, so you're there pretty much every day anyway, too. So yeah, I mean, I wake up at seven o'clock or six o'clock, and I come downstairs and turn the light on, and like this time of year, I'm checking for eggs, or uh, you know, like if I feed, I try to open every tub the next day just to make sure. Right. You know, some of the ball, py- not the ball pythons, some of the, especially male king snakes, we'll use that for an example. They don't want to eat this time of year. Like, it's hard to get them to eat. They don't want to eat. And you got to keep them separate from females for like three or four weeks before they go back on feed. But they'll take the rat. They'll take the rat and they'll wrap it up so you close the tub, you know. 
So the males, I always check the males and there's always, you know, I got 10 cow king males. There's three or four of them that took that rat and left it there. You know, you just blew my mind. I've never like, it always freak. I always worry that there's something wrong with one of my Kings or, or milks doesn't want to eat. That's just, yeah. During, especially males, females, Female hognose will eat as they're laying eggs. I mean, they'll always eat. If you got a female hognose the night food um, during breeding season, you, you you better turn that heat up. But uh, yeah, king snakes, milk snakes, you know, they got in their mind to breed. Dry marcon and false water cobras, they're going to eat regardless. You know, they're always going to slam. Uh, actually, you no, know, my my male cre- uh, my male back tail he 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 definitely doesn't like to eat if he's cruising and that's one thing about crebos if you don't pair them up they'll rip their own skin off i mean they arch their back and they i mean they will shred themselves they'll wear their face right off all right i guess i gotta really get on getting that female yellowtail then well I what my boy yeah. is to tear himself well no the female's not around so if oh, there's okay. no female you know the pheromones um where you just give them a little more space he could still do it but the li- it's not likely but they like the cow king males like it's we're getting to the tail end here, but if I, I'm looking up there and they're and they're some of the males are going like this, you can almost sex juvenile cow kings by how they behave <laughs> during breeding season. But they're not going to hurt themselves. But the the crebos are so big bodied, so strong, and so you know my way or the highway type deal. Like they literally will arch their back and push up against the top of the rack and just thrash and push and pull and they'll i mean it's like they'll really they'll really put it do a number of themselves so anytime i see extra movement i put the male in for you know 24 to 48 hours and take them out so hmm. yeah that's cool. i don't know too too much I'm, like i said i'm just getting into the colubrids like getting really into pits but dry mark everybody wants dry mark on right but they're just uh, well a couple years ago they weren't that damn popular really but um and still the blacktail crevos i mean if you look on my instagram every time i post i got eggs from this blacktails lay yet and you know yeah tons of people you know like i mean there's 15 people every post every time i post eggs i'll get dms the dry mar- the, or the false waters i'm like man that's already three clutches like, just look at the count yeah you know but uh yeah everybody wants to dry mark on that's for sure and i think the blacktail crevos are personally amazing i actually like them over the easterns but i mean there's a little something about the easterns because they're beautiful they're huge they're from north america they're kind of like you know if i mean if we had a a national snake i'm sure that would be it i would think do we have uh, one we might have one already i mean technically the the timber or cane break wherever you are was that, gonna cause... be it and then they went, eh, snakes, icky. We'll do the we'll do the bird. Oh, really? Yeah, like yeah. I did a I did a whole video about like the history of that and like the Gadsden's flag and everything like that. Um, it went back to like Benjamin Franklin's like join or die thing because he was like, this is this is us. The rattlesnake is us because it's you know you don't mess with us, we won't mess with you. But if you start coming and poking, so that was gonna be yeah. it. And then and then went to the bald eagle. Yeah, people don't like snakes. Well, I mean, I just didn't know if we have a national flower. We should have a national snake or whatever. But I mean, we we might, and actually, I don't know if we do. Actually, uh, yeah, if we officially do have a national snake, I, I get a lot of inquiries for the for the eastern indigo anyway. But yeah. I've just never had the desire to keep them because I'm still working on the black tail crebos, I guess. But man, I saw one at the Salt Lake show. This old man had it. And he he brought it with him to the show. And this damn thing was, I mean, I got big ass hands, bro. Like, I mean, I never seen anything like it in my life. It was big as around as a seven foot female BCI. Oh, man. I mean, I thought it was fake. I was like, it looked weird. I mean, I know it was old, but it was just like wrapped around his shoulder and oh. not moving. And I mean, this snake's head was bigger than a deck of cards by far. That's so crazy. That's it always freaks me out whenever you handle like, just a large colubrid like that because it's like when they move you don't expect something you don't you don't expect a colubrid to be that big and so when they move and cruise around on you're just kind of like oh what the heck is going on i mean my experience with colubrids if they're gonna bite they're gonna bite out of the tub once you get them out yeah you know, they're fine 
That's true. My fault. One of my false waters, it'll like bite you as it's cruising on you. Oh, really? I don't really appreciate that so much, so I don't handle it much. Yeah, that's that. Uh, they do those kind of. It'll like be fine. Bites. It won't hood up or anything, and you'll be kind of holding it. It'll like go across your chest and bite, and then bite, and then bite. <laughs> but it's not like biting and twisting. It just kind of just bites, and then it's kind of weird. That's so weird. That's it's almost like it's feel like you know how like dogs are kind of mouthy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they'll kind of just. Like, I have a great Dane puppy. She's super mouthy. She'll bite your shoulder down your arm. And and she's not hurting you. She's just mouthy, yeah. you know? I, that's, like, her way of interacting. Yeah. And uh, I almost feel like that's how he is. That's a little Because he's not biting you to eat you, and he's not biting you to hurt you. He's just, like, feeling you. Yeah, that, that, that's still a little disconcerting from what, you know, could be an eight-foot rear fang venomous snake. Oh, it's not comfortable at all. Yeah, it's, no. it's absolutely disconcerting. I, I've been keeping snakes forever, and I have a ton of them, and I do my damnedest to not get bit. I'm not one of those guys that sits out there and gets tore up. I, I don't, you know, I mean, if you get bit, you get bit. But uh, if I know a snake's flying out of the tub with its mouth open, which most of the king snakes do, you know, people at, people at home that have one or two king snakes, they can probably open their tub and pick it up. But when you have <laughs> 60 of them, you know, they're going to have a little bit different behavior because I'm not opening the tub all the time, picking it up. So they kind of come out like this and I kind of one hand over here, get it over here, back over here. And then I'll back, pick it from behind, turn around and it'll kind of look at me like, and then realize no food. But they're definitely smart. Colubrids are, I think colubrids are by far the most smart species of snakes. You know, There's not a, saying a lot considering hognos are colubrids and they're the dumbest species of snakes. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's, I will say that there's definitely good, good arguments to be made in that favor. I've had some, some weird stories with like my boas, but they're smarter than balls. They're smarter than berms. Yeah, I think so. I have boas. I did, I did get a boa litter. I need to add that to the list. That's not on the list. <laughs> I got a nice boa litter in 2019, but I had four females. No, I, I ran two that year. I got one litter and one, one uh, infertile litter. And I was kind of bummed. I thought, okay, next year, the next year I ran, I had six females total. I ran two and then four. Cause you know, he's always supposed to do it every other year. I got zero litters and the males were tied up all the time. Yep. two of the females dropped duds and two didn't even do that so i i called my buddy in socal and said bro you're the boa guy i'm <laughs> not this is way too much space you'll make it happen i want to f- fill the space with colubrids because that's what i the most i yep. mean there's some awesome boas out there man i mean there's some boas that are stunning i mean oh yeah you know but i just to me, the most stunning thing is is colubrids, and it'll probably always be that way. I mean, I, yeah, def- definitely, just like the natural, just just the way they are, in and of itself, no more for anything like that. Just the variability of it, the natural iridescence, their behavior, everything like that, just makes them just a more fun, interactive snake. Just period for, for yeah. every species. Well, my next snake to lay is going to be the Marina del Rey mud. Which is a cow king species. Yeah. Today, today, clutch number fifty was the scissors crossing, pure locality. First time I produced a locality, and I was pretty excited about it because I, I, I feel like the hobby's really going that direction, especially in the boas. Boas mm-hmm. is big, but I think king snakes is getting there too. I wanted some pure locality stuff, so I got the scissors crossing. Next year, I'll have four female scissors crossings ready, yeah. not just one. I've been hearing those come up a little bit the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. The best though, you got you got Jawbone Canyon, which are really awesome looking too. I don't have any of those, mm-hmm. but the best in my opinion is the Marina Del Rey muds. And I tied two of them up this year. They were kind of on the cusp of either being big enough or not. And one took, and she is uh, going to lay tonight, I think, or tomorrow. Cool. And I'll probably hold all those babies back because they are just my favorite. I know if there's extra males, I would probably let them go. But I'm just like, you know, I like I like that pure locality. I also love the high white. High white got me on the cow kings. Yeah, they. Uh, there's something about I like the classic, just you know, thick black and white banded, and then high white, just nice thick dorsal stripes. Those things are just gorgeous. 
As long as it's white and not yellow or banana, as they call it. I don't really <laughs> like the yellowing so much or the banana color. Eh, keep those with uh, like Floridas and stuff. Yeah, when you get that, yeah, I got some cool Floridas too. That's I I produced some pure locality Floridas this year. I'm so excited about because the first year the male wasn't large enough, so I bred an Ennery to an Exantic because mm-hmm. they're different in Floridas. I don't I don't call Brooks and Floridas. They're all one to me. I like, think it's the same damn thing. People argued all day. Some guy with the last name Brooks went and and started calling his own Brooks. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, Colubrid name, Ugh, yeah. I got some new New England Exanthic, which is different than Enry. And uh, I produced some Enry snakes to my New England Exanthic female, but my male wasn't big enough because they are one of the hardest pure locality Colubrids to find. And I got a beautiful clutch out of her this year. And I'm super stoked because they are almost all white with just very little black outlining. And then against the Ennery, which is uh, more black with white outlining. I don't think I've actually seen so, them. That sounds really cool. Oh, yeah. I can't wait for that clutch to hatch. It's uh, it's going to be awesome. So do you do definitely it? a bunch of keepers. Yeah. Do you do anything with the uh, Apalachicolas or... No, no, but I'm I'm gonna start. I'm gonna get some this year. Cool. Some of those kings. I'm gonna get some. I'm gonna get some variable kings. I did produce produce Arizona Mountain Kings. They hatch the smallest of all kings that I've ever seen, and they were just a pain in the ass to get to eat. So that's that's what I've heard. That's why I was like, got to do gecko juice or lizards. Yeah, and that gets them going. But I mean, I mean, I can get that or have it, but. I mean, with the other kings, you just toss in red hots and they go right for it. So, yeah, I actually produce kings. So I always wait for them to shed and then I I break the group up. Right. Mm -hmm. And I produced kings two years ago. And the day they left the egg, there was one king that was bigger than the rest. Oh, no. She ate one of the other babies. And I never heard of that. I talked to a bunch of breeders. They, They couldn't believe that she would eat before shedding or even eat one of her own siblings i was kind of wild man and that snake was already bigger it was like four times bigger than everything else in a week i mean it was insane did you have like but a, uh incubation time on them or something or just the one no i was through the same 82 degrees 82 degrees it just came out bigger probably a bigger egg um the uh bull snakes i feed the day they hatch and they eat yeah that's right crazy. away yeah <laughs> yeah right away frozen thawed first time never had him never had him deny it yeah take it right off the tongs so yeah, yeah that's them do you mess with any locality bull snakes no but i i would like to i don't i think there's a lot of people working that though you know but, so yeah, i don't want to popular i don't want to work stuff that too many people have so and and no reason in particular right it's just uh I still enjoy the morphs of the bulls. The like the white sided albino is my favorite bull morph because it looks like a snow and it has like a very, very light cream color down the top. Mm-hmm. So um and the red albino, it's a big hit. Yeah. I wanted to make some high binos this year. I'm making double head high, high binos. The only clutch I've had go bad this year was my uh double head high bino clutch. Oh. For whatever reason. She did not shed before she laid eggs, and the eggs were perfect, but I didn't have a nest box in there. Yeah. And uh, I caught her laying them, but the problem is, when you don't have a nest box, even if you catch them laying, they've already held those eggs for probably 48 hours longer than they should have because they want a, like, a nice spot to lay. Yeah. So they kind of came out a little chalky, and I only got one good egg out of the nine. And, I mean, I can't really blame myself because she didn't shed. Yeah. She came out of Bermation, shed, she was paired, and she laid the eggs, you know. They shed out of Bermation, you pair them, yep. beat them up, then they shed, then you put the nest box in five days after shed, and on that 10th to 15th day they lay. I try not to put my nest boxes in prematurely because, you know, they do dry out. And if you rehydrate, at least the way I do it, it's never quite the same. It's almost too wet. Hmm. You know what I mean? I use the cocoa husk. I, I, I make it in a bucket, right, and make the dirt. 
Right. And then I'll put that in there and I'll take the dry cocoa core and I'll put a handful or two in there and I'll hand mix it and it hydrates the cocoa core enough. But I wait for about five days after they shed, I tag it and throw the deal in. But she, for whatever reason, laid without shedding. And I thought that was interesting. Hmm. So, yeah, they like to mess with you sometimes. Well, I mean, I think it was kind of rare, but I mean, I'm thinking, I'm almost thinking she, I paired her last year. She didn't produce. And I think she retained. And when she shed out of brumation, she was doing her pre lay shed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I got a weird split clutch from a retained sperm last year too. Yeah. But what did I have that did a retained sperm clutch? That wasn't a double clutch. Oh, my uh, Pueblins. I produced them last year in like April or May. Mm -hmm. Didn't pair again because they're small. They they stay small. And I didn't pair again. And they're Halloween Pueblins, right? Right. On Halloween day, she (laughs) laid another clutch. Her first clutch was five. And her Halloween clutch was nine. And uh, at least I like to say it was Halloween because I didn't find them for four days. But I know what eggs look like day to day to day to day when you don't find them right and they were almost where they could be hydrated but just not right there so it was either october 31st or november 1st because i found them on let's say november 3rd you know because if they're not going to lay i'm not opening that tub but every four four to five days anyway yeah that's doing a quick peek grabbing turds checking waters yeah that but i mean i didn't pair her and usually to get a double clutch you in the same season you've got a pair Mm -hmm. but you know the only species which is kind of unless i don't want to control your pocket if you have questions go ahead and shoot them but i was gonna say the only species that's kind of given me a little bit of run for my money and people will probably laugh is nelson's milk snakes i have an one adult female and i've got a project that's going to be ready next year and I've paired those damn things up to her for three years. The males that are the right size. This is the third season. I still have not got a clutch from them. And I've, se- I've seen them kind of like do the breeding behavior, but I've never seen like a real good lock. So, yeah, I, have I don't a- know. Maybe Nelson's milks aren't my thing. Well, I'm, I'm with you. I've only actually ever paired up two species of colubrids and Nelson's were one of them. It was a, a blotched head albino to a double head. And three years in a row, nothing. See, what is going on with that? I'm going to have to get into that because I look, what I do is when I, I wasn't being as successful as I wanted out the gate and I could call a couple friends and they could tell me how they would do it or whatever, mm-hmm. how they would do it doesn't matter. I live in Washington. Yeah. They can live in Texas, Florida, or SoCal. So that can aid in the bed, their ability to breathe those. It can make it easier for them. Yeah. So I kind of threw all that out and I would look up the individual species for where it's from as far as where it's native to and i would look up the weather patterns for 365 days i would find their winter and i would look at the day temp the average day temp of their winter and the night temp Mm -hmm. and then i what i started doing was getting thermostats that i could control a night drop to and giving them exactly what they get in their wild geographic right so Mm -hmm. um like the false water cobras they they have like a 10 degree night drop or maybe even a six for three months. And, you know, like the Kribos, they're going to stay 82 for 365 days a year. But, you know, 10 of those weeks, the night drop is 60 or even 58. So then I'm going to I'm like, oh, shit, you know, you can look those things up and people say you don't cool them. That's not true. Yep. That's a cooling period. That's if 16 cool. hours of the day, they're sitting at 60 degrees. And they're like, oh, yeah, you don't cool them. You keep feeding them. Of course, they're going to feed, but their body is going to change slightly. So I put a night drop on. And for 10 weeks, you know, I dropped down into the high 50s, low 60s for 12 hours or even 14 hours a day. And they're still on the same meal plan. And that's the difference of breeding snakes. Like you cannot, you know, just like a corn snake, it doesn't have to bermate to produce, but it definitely needs a um barometric pressure change and there you're going to get that no matter where you live yep. you can live in costa rica you can live in taiwan you can live in guam canada alaska or washington 
you're going to get a barometric pressure because every region experiences some sort of winter. Yep. And that's all a corn snake needs. They don't necessarily need the temperature drop. They need the pressure change. So I cool my corns. I don't have to, but I do because it just works easy. Yep. And uh, I get big viable clutches and I make sure, you know, and my cooling period, and I tried six weeks one time. Did That was last year. I tried six weeks last year because – the year before I did, let's see, 14 weeks. Oh, wow. And I didn't, and I, and I had good production, but not as good as I thought. So now I do 10 to 12 weeks, wherever I feel like if I start seeing some movement, I'll bring the room up, you know, but, um, and I'm going to keep doing it the way I did it this year, because obviously I yeah, mean, you did pretty well this year, 50 clutches so far. So, but yeah, it, it's interesting, man. It's interesting. Like, it's not as easy as as people say it is, but at the same time, it's not as hard if you just take the time to really connect with that animal and understand right. its natural, you know, everything about it. And that's another thing. I got a DM the other day. I, I posted the false waters, and uh, she was laying eggs, and somebody DM'd me and said, you don't take care of your snakes. There's no water in that water bowl. And I said, I kind of, dude, I want to just rip on the guy, but <laughs> first of all, I know when my snakes are going to lay, I don't keep checking every single day. I know when I see the ovulation, especially in the colubras, and I know the pre-lay shed, I dump the water out and I put a quarter inch to half inch of water in there. Every day I'll add a little bit of water if she needs it because for those two to three to four days, if she tempts herself to lay in those, that water bowl, Yep. Those eggs drowned. And I had that happen three years ago with a Florida King. So if she lays it in the water and there's only a quarter inch of water, I'm going to take the eggs out, dry them off with a towel, and I'm going to incubate them and get babies. Yep. But uh, that's why you keep very minimal amounts of water in a water dish when you know your snake's going to lay. And that's another reason why I have narrow, taller water dishes, you know. But, yeah, I Florida King laid – I had the old – dog water dishes back you know before you start using you know the inserts yep and uh you go find 16 eggs in a water dish when you have a nest box there that's perfect you know <laughs> but they for whatever reason you know like a cow king will lay in, in dry nesting a florida wants to lay in real wet moist nesting but stuff like that you know i got that dm and it's like dude you don't know what you're talking about you know like you, you can't have a full water dish with a false water cobra who wants to play in the water and lay their clutch on the riverbank. You know what I mean? Like there's a reason for everything. And that snake's going to have a huge water bowl as soon as it lays the eggs. You know what I mean? Yep. So. I think that's, that's that mentality that comes from somebody who not necessarily doesn't know what they're doing, but probably only keeps like one or two species, probably a ball python. Probably never produced animals, but yeah. that's that social media. That's why I deleted Facebook. I deleted Facebook about 18 months ago because I just didn't want to be a part of that community anymore. Like there's some great classifieds, but they were getting attacked by Facebook themselves. They're getting yeah. taken down on the regular. And, you know, I'm sure I've missed out on great opportunities for animals, but I kind of like to keep a closed collection at this point and work with what I have and add stuff slowly and and if i'm adding them i want babies i don't want to buy you know somebody's seven-year-old pair of cow kings that they never got to produce because they really have two males you know what i mean i don't want that surprise yeah. at my doorstep anymore <laughs> like i've been through that so it uh you know if i want something i'll, I'll just get on morph market and i'll pay the money i don't need to find a stellar deal on facebook you know yep. and and that's what Facebook was to me, because if you get into the the uh, husbandry forums and stuff, it's just so much nonsense, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. And then if anybody's got an animal that needs, you know, some kind of medical attention, you got 37 people behind the first person that already said vet. And they're like, vet, 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 vet. You know, most of the time, it's a simple fix can correct something, you know, like it's really it's almost caging every time. Yep. It's almost caging. And what people don't get with the racks is the racks allow you to have that ambient temperature that a, that a cage will never allow unless you have a heat panel and a PVC cage. 
which yeah. is where well, they're amazing. But most of these people are still using glass and then they want to just tackle you. So I just said adios to Facebook. Yep. I get that. That's yeah, that's a, that's a struggle that it's want to sit there and try to be like a little bit of a voice of reason or even be there. If someone's having like a genuine question and then it's just, bleh. yeah. Well, I love Instagram, man. I think Instagram is a great tool for our community. And uh, as long as people stay the course and stay in their lane and, and, and they don't get involved in drama and, you know, that Facebook stuff and drag it over, you know, we have a really good ability with Instagram to, to communicate and, mm-hmm. and do our thing. So. It's true. I haven't seen anything nearly uh, as crazy as. Obnoxious as Facebook. Yeah. That's a good word. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Instagram is definitely I think Instagram is honestly with when the Asian countries started importing all the colubrids, right? So you had first Hong Kong. Hong Kong started taking all the colubrids probably around 2014. Uh-huh. That's when they first started showing some interest. And I mean it got big in 2015 and 2016. You know, I mean Hong Kong was literally sucking up all the colubrids. That's where your MBK went from $40 to $300 in the course of five or six years Yep. because supply and demand, you know, and what created the demand was the social media accounts of these people in other countries who kind of like idolize the, the animal. And they like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, if you look at some of the, like, and then, you know, Japan was right after Hong Kong. And South Korea came right after that. And and that's all social media driven. It's not like somebody's on the phone saying, what are you up to over there in Hong Kong? And somebody's like, oh, I got a, I got this really cool colubrid from North America. No, it's, it's social media. Like, and that was great for our, our, uh, our industry and not from a financial standpoint. It's not great for me or you to be able to sell a snake for more than we could have five years ago. No. It's great as far as, social media also improved husbandry Mm -hmm. and communication. Like you see, so if you spend more money on an animal, this is human instinct. And and me and you aren't that way. And a lot of people that are going to listen to this aren't that way, but you're going to protect your investment. So if you spend $40 on something and you spend $400 on something, you're not going to want to lose that 400 bucks. Yep. You're going to go to the end of the world to make sure that animal is taking care of property. Now, I'm not talking about you or me because we're going to treat every animal the same. Whether it's an AML corn or a black-tailed Kribo, I'm going to make sure it has the right thing. And I know a lot of people listen the same way. But there are people in the hobby that like to buy deals. What's the cheapest snake? You know, I don't want to sell to that person either. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like where the sulcatas fall in. Yeah. You can get a sulcata for $45, $50. You know, I'd rather sell somebody a leopard tortoise for 250 uh-huh. and I know they're going to go spend that 50 bucks on that T5. And I know they're going to, you know what I mean? Like, and there's, there's people that are, like I said, they're going to listen to this. I got to make sure I say that over and over. So nobody gets upset <laughs> that want a Sokata and they're going to take good care of it. But there's a lot of people that show up to these shows with auntie, uncle, cousin, mom, and dad. And they're like 50 bucks for that cute tortoise. I'll take it. Yep. You know what I mean? So when you when I, back to what I'm saying, the, the all the Asian countries that start exporting all these colubrids, they raise the bar because they like the way they what's the right word? The way they like um, kind of showcase their lives and how they take care of stuff. It means a lot to them. Like that snake, I mean it. Like you know what I mean? Like the caging and the and the, what's a, inside. It's just a complete point of pride on a level that there you go they're very them. prideful about taking care of this animal yeah and it's spread it's spread you got south america and north america and canada and europe and all these people start seeing these beautiful animals that they've never been exposed to and instead of buying a 10 gallon tank and some ass embedding and, and putting it in the corner right they're buying the pvc cages they're or they're buying a glass tank that's nice and they're gonna retrofit the lid to hold humidity and they're going to put a fogger in it and they're going to put fake plants or real plants and isopods and they're going to understand the feeding schedule and the proper handling and it's just grown the industry to to new lengths and it's a good thing man like 
a snake, a $25 corn snake shouldn't be $25. No, no snake should sell for less than a hundred bucks. Cause you know what, if you want an animal, you should pay a hundred dollars. That's, I think that's good. I don't like that, you know, like disposable or training wheels pet that a lot of reptiles get lumped into. Cause it's, a and I'm telling you it happens for decades from a lot of the time. And yeah, it's not something that you should just willy nilly impulse get just because. So exactly. When I first started uh, a friend of mine producing sulcatas and he would send them to me for the shows because in the Pacific Northwest, there is a guy in Oregon that's producing uh, cherry head redfoots. He doesn't come to the shows though. So, you know, you got 10,000 people walking to the door of a show. You got between 50 and 70 uh, vendors and there's no tortoises. So I'm like, you know, what? and it's not about capitalizing on the sale. Like I'd rather sell my snakes, but I'm like, Hey, shoot me some tortoises, send them to me, you know, two days before the show, we'll soak them, hydrate them, feed them and we'll sell them for you. So, and it's really, it's not for me, man. And it's not even for him. It's for the community, my local community. Yep. An ability to get a tortoise that's not wild caught and, or told that's captive bred and come from some random Google reptile company. You know what I mean? So, but I was selling sulcatas and it was actually Joe. I talked to Joe hmm. and we were in the back room on the podcast and he's like, why do you sell sulcatas? And I was telling him, well, because, you know, I want to give the, the community an opportunity to own a tortoise. You know, there's a lot of people want tortoises and, and this is in Texas. This ain't Florida. This ain't SoCal. Yeah. That's where captive bred tortoises are everywhere. And uh, he's like, man, I, I really think you should have a second thought about selling sulcatas. And I thought, and, and we, we discussed it. I thought, man, why did I didn't decide that on my own? You know what I mean? 50 bucks for a shelled friend is not enough because the, the, the lack of, like I said earlier, protecting your investment. You spend 400 bucks on a tortoise. That tortoise is, you don't want to spend that $400 twice, 50 bucks. Some people are like, eh, 50 bucks. Kids were happy for a few weeks. Exactly. So, but anyway, yeah, I think, man, the Asian countries getting involved with colubrids and I'm not talking about pythons or boas because they can't, they can't uh, import them, but it, it took the hobby to new lengths and a whole. Oh yeah, it did. And if they ever, if Hong Kong ever opens up and says ball pythons coming back, you're going to see a whole another wave of ball pythons. Oh man, it, it will be crazy. It will be insane. So, I mean, part uh, of me wants it to happen because I breed a lot of like the leucistic ball pythons and like pides and stuff, and they really like those high white animals, which sounds oh, like dude, it would be amazing. For our, it will be amazing. It would be amazing for our, our hobby. It's not a bad thing. Yep. The more value there, okay, so. Like I say, it protects the animals first and foremost, but it's going to, the supply and demand is going to change. More people will get involved. The shows will get bigger. Mm -hmm. People have, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and people that breed snakes, like I've ran into very few people complain. Sorry, I keep adjusting my ear pods. Complain like, oh, you shouldn't breed snakes for sale. Okay. Are you kidding me? You're buying snakes. So don't tell me I shouldn't breed them for sale. You want to buy them from Petco or PetSmart where they've changed hand three times? You know, it's not It's not like I'm like, I'm going to capitalize and, and breed snakes for the rest of my life. Like, first of all, it's a passion. And nobody can tell me my passion, right? Like, it's my passion. And someone's got to produce this stuff. And, and what better opportunity to buy direct? Yep. You know what I mean? Like, we've all seen the second, third hand suppliers and how that works, you know? Like, so people should give the the breeders that they, if you can reach out to a breeder and tell them, why are you breeding snakes? You, 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 that's a win for you. You can reach out to that breeder and buy a snake and not buy it from a third party. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Like that's, it's a small business. It's coming right from the hand of the guy that, you know what I mean? Like, yep. Produced it. So but I, I've, I've ran into very little of that kind of behavior like most people are super like supportive and like it and and a friend of mine told me he he's like involved with you know everybody's kind of afraid of the word rescue but he's been doing rescues and has a the the federal license for rescuing we call it 5013c or whatever that's the tax deal and then he has a federal he works with the police department 
And he said, so when he goes to the seizures, nine out of 10 times, the animal is from a big box store. He's never heard when they, he goes to collect these animals from the owner that uh, they say, oh, I bought this from so-and-so breeder on Morph Market. Or, you know, it's just not going to happen. Nope. It's all people pushing animals back and forth on Craigslist and or big box stores where you're not going to have that one-on-one ability to discuss uh, husbandry, feeding. If you run into a problem, dude, I help people that don't buy stuff from me. Yep. I've helped people and then they turn around and a week later say, look at the snake I bought from so-and-so. And it's kind of like, man, dude, I just spent two hours with you over <laughs> a course of seven days. But, you know, at least I know the animal's got the guy, the individual has the ability to take care of the animal. Yep. So when you look at the stuff that shows up on rescues, it's it's often in common that it comes from the big box stores where they don't have that direct line to a breeder or information and or they probably really weren't that interested in reptiles to begin with. You know what I mean? Yeah. They just No one's going to text me or, or message me who's not interested in reptiles. If they're interested in reptiles, they're going to want to do their best for the pet. You know what I mean? Yep. So I feel like I've been rambling and taking over your podcast. I'm sure you have some questions or. No, uh, it was really good. I mean, it's basically, I don't know too, too much about colubrids and, and things like that. And so there's this old adage that I heard from somebody where it's, if, if somebody's doing something very successfully for a long period of time or not, but they're doing it the right way and they're doing it successfully, just shut up and listen. Oh yeah. And so that's what I usually do. And so, you know, we can have a good back and forth sometimes, but if it's a specifically a subject that I don't really know a whole lot about, I will usually just kind of, as I knock the mic around, um, just kind of quiet down a little bit and I'll pop in when, you know, it needs to go in there, but just to hear someone who does it a different way, but is still successful or just working with a species that I know nothing about, like we don't keep hobbies. And so that's why, you know, run with that because I don't know a whole lot about them. A lot of people here in Colorado don't know a whole lot about them. So I want to hear about them. Those are really cool. Like, you know, we know the tricolors are different than the Westerns for a variety of different reasons. I mean, they come from a different continent, but yeah, know. yeah, different humidity requirements, different yearly annual temperature graduates and everything. So exactly. But you know, the perfect bioactive species, I never would have thought that a tricolor. Dude, would... what, tell me what snake would make a better bioactive, maybe a green vine snake, I guess. Maybe, but I mean, you know what I mean? But... It, yeah. It's like, well, of course that's perfect. They, they burrow. They love the moisture. And the, like I say, that you could put a UVB on a on a, one of them low boy exoterras. Yep. Do your layers of uh, the clay balls with the weed barrier and then the dirt and the sand, the dirt and your isopods. You know, like that's the way to do it, right? Yep. And that tricolor, Jesus, like you'll, it's the, I always tell people, like, people always looking for their first snake and it's either a ball python or corn snake, king snake. Yeah, I'm like, if you're going to have one snake and you want something just beautiful sitting there and you want an eye grabber and maybe you don't. And if you want to handle the snake, it's a great snake. If you never want to handle it, it's even a greater snake. <laughs> get you set up with the, the you know, the bioactive and get you a tricolor. That thing is so curious. Don't get curious and smart confused because they are not smart yep. as far as <laughs> they're dingy. Westerns are super dingy, but I mean, yeah, tricolors are just the best, you know. Um, I've got a friend that's really into Westerns and I gave her a tricolor because I thought, you know, you already have all these Westerns and uh, you love hog nose and she's really into bioactives and uh, the bugs. I'm like, you should have a tricolor. So I'm going <laughs> to give you a tricolor. Awesome. And uh, yeah, she loves it. Right. She's like, this is so different, but so the same, at the same time, you know, but they're very strong and fast when a Western is not strong, kind of puffy and, and kind of dipsy, you know, I've got some Westerns that can move pretty quick, but not like a tricolor. I mean, they're, they move like a milk snake, you know, they want to go, they're going. That's awesome. So, but they still have that hog nose attitude though. They're almost more tame to be honest <laughs> with you. They're not as derpy, but I know people like and the that. females, dude, I'm go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I think that might be like a big seller. Cause they like that, like that cute puppy dog, you know, pug nose 
thing of the of the westerns and I guess the easterns too that everybody really loves. But maybe not. Yeah, I haven't got into the easterns. I was going to I, a, a friend was a former friend was supposed to hook me up with the, uh, some. We were doing kind of breeding exchanges, and I ended up never getting anything out of it. And that's fine, but uh, not breeding exchanges, but like baby exchanges and right and things. But um, I think uh, I think the easterns would be cool, but. I don't know, man. I like the Westerns and the tricolors. I, I got some Western projects that are pretty excited about. And his snow was kind of abandoned when Sable hit and some of these other uh, genetics hit. Snow was kind of like, and, I, and I've been hitting the snow as hard. I should have. I just, I'm watching these uh, those eggs swell and sweat. I, mean, I can't wait for more snows. I had some snows last week, but uh, and then that wasn't even to a, that was a pos head of pos heads. And I got two out of seven of them were snows that was pretty cool but i got a lot of snow stuff coming snow conda mm -hmm. conda to conda both one visual snow one hat snow so i could get some uh super yetis i'm pretty excited about that but the problem with hog nose man i don't sell them i, I hold them back yeah. because i sold them all and uh <laughs> then I, I didn't raise anything back so now i have this weird thing where i just keep them they're easy to take care of you know i changed the bedding and give them water and I feed them and the way I keep them, they hammer the food and yeah. it's kind of like artwork to me, you know, like, look, look at this painting. Well, look at this snake, you know, but I don't like selling the hog nose. I love selling everything else, but the hog nose are kind of like, I don't keep this one. I'll keep that one. I'm going to keep this one. And then I'll go through to pull stuff for a show. I'll have like, okay, these 22 snakes I'm going to take to a show. And then I'll, uh, I'll start pulling stuff. And then now there's only 17 because I just put five more in the whole back, you know, like, but yeah, hog nose are fun, but yeah, the Easterns are cool, but they're just not my thing. Not, told, not really my bag. I've been told they're, they're a little bit harder to kind of establish. I don't know. if that's I think that was before, you know, you got some of those F ones, which is like first generation wild caught babies. Not, they're not wild caught, but they came from wild caught, but now people are getting into like the F2, F3 generations, and that's when things really change, hmm. you know, as far as, dude, I know people will probably, it depends on who can hear this or who pays attention and how people feel about the hobby, but I feel like the hobby so far progressed that wild caught stuff should, I don't care what it is. If we keep in captivity, as far as, as, as much as we know, we should be able to breed it in captivity. Like I, I wish wild caught like would just go away. I mean, it would make, it'd be so positive for the hobby. I mean, what's wild caught that's not being produced that we, we have to have, maybe there's a few things that aren't being produced. Well, you know, leave those up to the, to the, uh, herpetology departments and the college is to produce. But I mean, we're talking less than five, 10 species, like everything else yep. somewhere, somebody produces like, especially like the wild caught lizards. It's just so unnecessary. Like I went to the show in Vegas and, you know, five pet stores and everything they're offering is, you know, wild caught lizards. And it's just like, fuck. I really, like, wish why? That, yeah, definitely the lizards. So like, I really wish that, you know, it was just like, I don't want to say just an all out ban on importation, but if we had just like a such Not a, imports, because there's captive bred stuff. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, talking about the yeah, wild caught. Yeah. But like, if who, no one breeds captive bred savannah monitors. But the day that. Have you ever so seen one? Yeah, exactly. They're amazing. They look different. They're nice. Yeah. They got like peach and pink and purple colors on them. And then if, you know, multiple people start doing that, they can truly dial in the husbandry for that animal because how many people say, Mole, what's your first monitor? Intro Savannah. They can dial or in. Nile, or a Nile. Or a Nile. I don't, don't get me started on the Niles. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably really run with that one. But, you yeah. know, the problem with Savannahs is people keep them so overweight. They're, in, yeah. and if you look at them in the wild, they're a leaner species. And if you see a, a, a well taken care of savanna, I'm not, I don't have a problem with people making their animals heavy. But I mean, we're talking, you know, yeah, five or six pancakes stacked up is what they look like sitting down. A savanna should look like a Subway sandwich, not, yep. not the two and a half pound hamburger. So, yeah, exactly. But yeah, my point exactly, you know, you, you got people bringing in. Savannah monitors for twelve dollars a piece, and then selling them at shows for thirty-five bucks. Still, yeah, it's twenty twenty-one, man. We shouldn't be doing this stuff. You know, they're, they're, you shouldn't be selling uh, green iguanas for five or fifteen bucks or ten bucks or eight. You know, like those animals are so like. 
I know they're one of the first in the trade, but they're so far, like, as far as, like, the ability to care for an adult, it's like a Sokata. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, you need so much space and so much knowledge, and and those things just don't get what they deserve. But I'm not against people keeping green iguanas or any iguana at that matter, but the price point is atrocious. That's why I was kind of – I know it's messed up to say, but, like, the ability to breed and sell them being depleted in Florida now – might make it so now people really only exclusively breed for like all the different morphs and stuff. And that might raise that price point. And then just yeah. like, just like full circle that we talked about, then more people who get not the $25 pet co iguana, but they're buying, you know, the crowd. Oh, dude, I still see that stuff at reptile shows though. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, but not, I mean, not too often, but like in Vegas, there is iguanas for 25 bucks. Really? And, you know, oh, dude, at, there was iguanas that were just a little bit bigger for 50 in the markup. You know, those guys are getting those for five to 10 bucks and they're probably probably wild caught. I mean, I doubt they're farmed and or captive bred, but yeah. I just, you know, I would like to see the keepers come together and be like, OK, let's 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 put the sulcatas or the green iguanas on the back burner and let's offer these people, you know, something. You know, I think like red foot tur- tortoises are great supplement for a sulcata and some people want to keep those sulcatas outdoors well maybe they should look at a hermit or a greek you know what i mean yeah hermani hermani but uh or leopard tortoise you know you live in texas you live in arizona you don't need a 300 pound sulcata that's going to make another thousand babies in two years you know do something cool that's going to have some value you know like hold some value to it and and you you can really like feel proud of, of producing you know i just like it's kind of like veiled chameleons at the same time. You know, the yeah, markup yeah. on those is atrocious. People are buying those for three, four, five, six, seven, eight bucks. And they put them for 50 to a hundred dollars. And, and a lot of those are wild caught, you know, it's true. So I know Hawaii has like a huge population of Jackson chameleons veiled and those are from veils too. Yeah. And, and I know Jackson's are from uh, Madagascar, I believe. Uh, I you know. think it might be an African mainland species. I don't really, I don't know. Oh, you're right. You're right. They are. I'm sorry. I don't know too much about chameleons. You're right. They are a mainland. They're in Africa. They're like Kenya. They're like Kenya where pancake tortoises live. They're like a desert species. But I know a friend of mine has a buddy in uh, Alaska or Alaska and Hawaii that could, he can go out any day and pull 50 Jacksons right out of the backyard. I mean, they're just everywhere because like Hawaii doesn't have snakes. Nope. They they have lizards, so you know it's, it was a common practice to get the Jacksons whenever that happened in the eighties and nineties. And you have you know veil commit. I you know people know about the tegus in Florida and the green iguanas. Most people have no idea about the veiled chameleons. They are by the billions, bro. Yo, the billions. My buddy could step outside and fill a coffee can with a hundred of them in, in one evening. Yeah, I don't know. What I mean, or a thousand. Yeah, those are Cuban tree frogs. I don't know which is those things. Really. Oh, are those pretty? Are those pretty all over there too? Uh, yeah, I've been told that like that's that's what you hear most often is Cuban tree frogs. Wow. So I just think that I mean I think we're really progressing as a as an industry, but I just think there's a lot of things we could do, come together and do it and, and and just continue to to grow and make things even better, you know. But I'm I just I just you know, I don't think there should be a ban on any species, but I think we need to like really start looking at the wild caught stuff. And you know, you get a lot of these first time reptile owners, the 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 mom that takes her kid and they're interested and they buy a, a grass tail, long grass tail lizard or whatever. Yep. They shouldn't be buying that. No, nope. you know, they should be buying a captive bred bearded or Euromastix or you know what I mean, or you know, something, you know, and, and directly from the breeder. They shouldn't be buying something that's traveled for three months and, you know, you know what I'm saying? But, Oh yeah. I just, there's always room for improvement for us, you know, like in, in, in any industry, but this one's important. It really is. And I think, I think you're right. That would be, I think like the best first step to like bring it in and, you know, a lot of those activist groups to kind of really ease off the back burner a bit would be, you know, the we don't politicians too. Yeah. We don't, we don't ban, you know, wild Anything. caught imports, but you know, as you said, collectively as a whole, 
just just captive bred stuff, and that's what we focus let's on. Let's do better. Yeah, you know, still so let's put some effort into producing the uh, Vietnam house geckos. Like, yeah, those things come in by the bag of a hundred for twenty five fifty cents a piece. They, dude, I so a friend of mine bought a hundred of them for uh, feeders for his gray bandits, and we opened the bag. There was over fifty eggs in there. Like, all you have to do is incubate those eggs, raise those up. And let them produce. Like, there's just no reason to be buying a hundred Vietnam house geckos. Like, we yep. should be self sustainful when it comes to that kind of stuff. And it's not. It's not like it's gonna be hard to do. It really isn't. But whatever. You know. Hopefully, we get there. I because think the acclimation and the thing about those animals is they don't get the proper acclimation and or the deworming. You know, people are gonna listen to this podcast and probably hate me, but uh, <laughs> whatever. You know, I don't give a shit. I just say what I feel, and that's how I feel. But, you know, like, it's like those guys get that stuff and it hits the shelf. Like, you need to, those need acclimation. They need daily soaks. They need panicure and flagell. And they need, you know what I mean? They need to be dewormed. Yep. And just, you know, who knows if it happens? Who knows if it doesn't? There's probably some shops out there that be like, this guy's talking. We do all that. You know, well, good for you. But, you know, I breed him. Know. Breed him. Yeah. Yeah. Breed him. And then you'll get my attention, you know. Yeah. I really I'll, be, I'll be first to tell you. Selective so. people are just like, all right, you know, the three of us, we're going to work this project and we're going to get these guys established. Like, this is it. Like, the Spider Man and Gama, that's what we're going to do. That's it. And then, you know, yeah. individual species that we know are amazing and the care is not crazy, but the price point will be that over that, you know, Craigslist ad. Dude, take this for a good example. The zebra skink from Kenya, right? It, it doesn't come in anymore. Yep. And it, it doesn't need to be because I'll tell you what, those give live birth. The value of those things went from 15 or 20 bucks to two to $400. They live in like a colony. Like when they produce, yep. the mom and the dad stay and the 10 babies hang out and they teach them like how to behave. And like that, tell me that wasn't a positive thing. You know what I mean? Like instead of 15, 20 bucks wild caught emaciated with scars, you have people selling captive bred baby zebra skinks for 250 bucks or 175 and their behavior is different and they're super cool. And you know, like it's like the fire skink. I've seen those as low as five ninety nine. Wow. There's a guy that captive produced them in Washington. Saw it two years ago. He sold out at 125 bucks. Wow. The same people that bought them at the show for 125. Could have went to Petco and bought them for twenty five hmm. or or fifteen, but a captive produced fire skink. And you look at that dang thing compared to what you see at that pet store. It was beautiful. It was different, man. It like it was fuller and thicker, and it just had a shine to it. And you're like, I mean, look at the value went up just captive breed. Like, and you know what? It's probably the same as the zebra skink. It's not hard to produce, mm-hmm. and you know, I saw a Schneider skinks. And Berber skinks, captive bred. You seen the prices on those things? I haven't looked too much into them. Thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! I bought one in 1996. I was 11 years old for 25 bucks at a pet store that's obviously no longer in business. Oh man, my favorite skink ever, dude, a Schneider skink. And they're a thousand bucks a piece, captive bred. I mean, maybe you could find some. I give you a deal for 500, but. It's like, you know, I think that's great, dude. If I want a Schneider skink, I should have to pay a thousand bucks. Fuck it. You know, I'll get a little baby skink. That's yep. super cool. Like, that's good. I don't want to skink for 25. I want to skink for a thousand. And I want a captive bred skink. So, yeah. And I think that, you know, captive bred is the way to go, I think, for like, I get that the wild caught or whatever is good for like rejuvenating like wild blood, like, captive blood. yeah like watering down the bloodlines that way they're not you know saying all related and stuff but like you take colubrids almost every colubrid species and and ball pythons and boas it's far enough watered out there's so many there's hundreds of thousands of them we don't need you know what i mean but none of that stuff really comes in i mean i know that they still bring in uh kind of facility bred ball pythons but it's few and far between we have so many here anyway you know, I, and, and with every new morph, you got to remember, there's a lot of normals born because we're doing, you know, head to head. So, yep. Yeah. And that should be enough to, uh, you know, to suffice that whatever, you know, the, the, the new, the people that want the, 
the first ball python. And it shouldn't be 25 bucks either. It should be 75 or 100 bucks because it's a living creature. Exactly. So, yep. Well, we are, ooh, we're doing pretty good on time, actually. That's awesome. What time is it? Uh, so my time, it's 8.40. So we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes-ish. Damn, it's been a good podcast, thing because I haven't been looking at the clock and worried about it. Normally I don't, but there's uh, a lot of goings ons that I have here, and so I have to like, okay, well, I got to see what time it is because people are gonna, sure. people will arrive and dogs will get set off and sure. Well, hey, we can end it when you're ready. I feel like I said quite a bit, but hey, I really you want to do. It's really great. Yeah. Man. yeah, I know you tried to get me on for a few weeks, and I had all those shows back to back. And yep, it's a lot of work, man. The shows and then taking care of all these animals and. And and during, especially during egg laying, you know, I, you got to be on top of it. So, uh, thanks for being patient. Thanks for having me on, giving me an opportunity and a platform. I appreciate it a lot. No, oh, no, you're good. Actually, I kind of want to let, let's do this really quick. Um, so doing it full time, fifty clutches. You're going to be having a lot of them hatching in the next couple in the next month or so, right? Yeah. And then baby season happens. How much of your day is dedicated to feeding the babies? <sighs> Well, you know, keeping, I mean, keeping a, an adult collection is fairly easy the way I go about it. You know, like I, I do a couple racks every other day and then every rack gets hit within a week, you know, water and, and food yeah. and cleaned. And then every month I do a complete bedding change. I don't let it go past four weeks. Oh, oh sorry. Got a little, I'm still here. I had a notification pop up for battery. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I just do two racks at a time. Let's say there's 15 racks, you know, I, I can get through it in a week, but as far as the babies go, um, you know, they don't all lay 50 clutches at once. No. And depending on the species, like the, uh, bull snakes, I'll, I'll sell them after one meal. Like they're, they're fine. Yeah. The hog knows five meals unscented. That's the rule. Five meals unscented. They're ready to go. Um, king snakes. I like to do two or three meals. Um, corn snakes, same thing, two or three meals, milk snakes, two or three meals, the blue tongue skinks. I've been keeping them, hoarding them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's all, it, they sell all pretty fairly quick, but I'm, I am gonna, I am gonna, I don't, I don't do morph market like a lot of these guys do. Right. I, I get, I get a personal satisfaction and enjoyment out of the shows. Like I like to set my booth up and my, what my stuff looks like. I like to engage with people. I like to make my stuff look pretty and I will storefront. Like I'd rather do eight to 10 shows a year. And I don't care if I got to drive 15 hours than sell snakes on morph market. Like, because it, it doesn't matter what you do. You're never going to please those people. Like <laughs> you post something with six pictures. They want another one. You post something with one picture. They want one more. <laughs> it's always something, you know, it's always like I got a hem and haw about it. And very rarely, you know, uh, not very rarely. Half the people are like, I want that snake. I'll take it. Yeah. And I love that. But, you know, I don't want to ship one or two snakes five days a week or three days a week. I want to ship, I want to move 15 or 20 snakes at once, you know? So I just enjoy the shows. Right. So I'm not going to be blowing stuff out. And I do get hit on Instagram a lot. Um, and I, and I like that. I like Instagram. I think it's a great, it's a great platform. Yeah. It's not necessarily a sales platform, but I can throw something up in my story and just say DM and, you know, within majority of the time, 30 minutes, that snakes. Cause the people that are watching me are watching me for a reason. They're, right. they're, they're after that critter and, or, you know, whatever. So if I put like the false water cobras, I got three clutches. I might get a double clutch off my second female. If I post, when I post that those are ready, I fully expect them just to be gone. And I actually don't want that to happen. I'd like to be able to go to the show with, with a third of what I produce. So, Right. But you know, yeah, baby season is not a big deal. The hog nose take a little bit of work. I got it down pretty well. I use the pencil tubs for the corns, kings, and hogs and milks. Mm-hmm. They work amazing. I get an excellent feeding response, and I know it's because of the pencil tubs. You know, if you use a big tub, it's a lot more work. So we'll see. This is gonna be my first year with the ball python babies. I've only ever raised ball python babies. Last year I had a clutch uh highway babies uh, a friend of mine bought them all he just said i'll just take the clutch right <laughs> from as soon as they're out of the egg and i'll and i'll get them ready for my shop and i said perfect you know a reptile shop mm-hmm. um 
I didn't really want to open the market for ball pythons for myself when I was only going to have that one clutch. Right. This year I should have like four to eight clutches. So now I'm more willing to like do the morph market and or the show where it's like, I produce these, this is the projects I'm working, but just one off. I was like, Hey, just take it and, and do your thing with it. And, and thank you very much. But um, if, if, you know, if I'm going into something, I don't want just four baby balls. I want, 15 to 40 right you know so it's just kind of you know what i mean like i just stick with the clubers until i'm really producing so but yeah this year uh you know i don't feed mice to i don't want to feed the mice to the ball pythons i know a lot of people do that so if it's going to take work to get them on rats then i'll take the work to get it on rats but you know I, mean, you I don't what well, you're asking about my schedule i wake up in the morning i drink my coffee i come out here and do the sniff test make sure you know everything <laughs> smells good no rodents are left behind yep. and uh you know I'll, I'll drink a cup of coffee and go, start going through some pans and filling waters and, and i'll be out here for an hour and a half i got a big tv right here and i play music and or whatever and then i'll go in the house and and uh you know whatever the hell it is people do and hang out and just kind of break up the day maybe get ready for the day or take the kids to school and then i'll come back out for another hour and pick up clean up sweep i use the leaf blower in here and i blow the racks out i love these vision racks are great but they with the bedding people dog on me all the time on instagram because you can see the dust you can't <laughs> wipe that off it's like yeah. stuck you know what i mean like i use the leaf blower in each one of them and then open the garage and push everything out but then i'll come through and i'll clean and do waters and i'll i don't, I don't feed uh, everything all at once i do it like day by day by day yeah. That way I'm not doing, you know, three hours of feeding. I'm doing like 15 to 20 minutes at a time. So, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about the baby season. I'll handle it. I'm going to, I'll handle it. You know, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Nice. It's like the big game. You know what I mean? I got myself to this point. It's no big deal. A few hours a day. I think I can a few hours a day. Like, yeah, at the most, it could be even be less, you know, it don't take much fresh water, new paper towel move on to the next one you know each tub like the, the babies take me 30 to 50 seconds a tub like i can get through it you know grab put a bucket wipe it out dump it new water grab put it back close it feed yep. it and and i just get through it yeah it is what it is what are your goals man you gotta support your goals you know you're gonna get it you gotta get after it so yep that's it's true. just what you do nice well, uh, I think that was pretty good for uh, for me. It was really great just, you know, doing some reptile talk. Nice. I appreciate you having me again. I appreciate the platform, and, and I'll share the the feed, and, and we'll get it moving out for you. Well, really appreciate it. Probably be a little bit because I, uh, I like to try to stack them a little bit. Cause I'll take your time. If it comes out in two months, that's fine by me. Yeah, it's uh, few and far between uh, people who get back to me, so that's why I'm very, very grateful for your time. Yeah, absolutely. So For sure. Do the do the usual your wrap up. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you for just checking out your stuff, or if they're interested in purchasing some babies coming up this year, where's the best place to find you? Only Instagram. I'm all in on Instagram. I mean, at Evergreen State Reptiles. I do have a TikTok at Evergreen State Reptiles. And if you don't have Instagram and don't want to download it, uh evergreen state reptiles at gmail but i don't i yeah it's just the best best way for me to go you ever so you ever gonna do like a website for yourself or i, I did have a website and uh it was uh what do you call it the server was out of sweden it was the biggest pain in the butt and oh, it kind of soured me on it because the customer service hours were in the middle of the night and oh. i mean it wasn't the end of the world but it wasn't as cool as i i thought it should have been I think websites are kind of a thing of the past though, man. I just like, you know, I don't know. I have the clothes on the uh, store frontier, Evergreen State Reptiles and Store Frontier. But um, I might do another website again, but we'll see how big it gets, you know? Yeah. We'll see how big it gets. You, you will find me on Morph Market depending on what it is. That'll be a thing. Cool. So. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing more of your stuff and uh, maybe at some point if I can. Uh get up there again missed you this last time just couldn't make it down there but see some of your really cool stuff yeah right on all right well thank Sounds you sounds good and you uh, want to just click off yep that'll work
All right, brother. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank we'll talk on Instagram. Thank you. Take care.